Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Now that we're through the holidays and the inauguration and budget address, we'll resume our weekly press conferences. And whenever they're in the State House or in the pavilion, we'll make sure to have remote access for reporters around the state. I'm sure you have a few things on your mind today, but first I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing the $3 million Rural Infrastructure Assistance Program I'm requesting in BAA. As you've seen, uh, members of my team have spent the last two to three months visiting parts of the state on an ARPA tour, where they've heard from Vermonters in smaller, more rural areas about their infrastructure needs and how they could use some help. As a matter of fact, yesterday the team was in Orange County, and uh, like others, they had a good turnout. It's clear that towns and villages across Vermont want to take advantage of the state and federal funding that was appropriated last year. And they're eager, eager to learn out about how they can do this. Because many of these towns have small select boards uh, with part-time clerks, they often rely on community volunteers to determine priority projects, submit applications, and if successful, they then try to manage them with all the reporting that comes along with it. They're simply not equipped to deal with them like Burlington, Rutland, or Montpelier is, who have full-time staff who typically uh, apply for and manage the grant funding. As I said in my inaugural address, uh, we should use the opportunity we have right now to help small towns build the infrastructure they could never afford on their own and solve problems that have stifled their economic progress for far too long. Things like Water, sewer, stormwater, broadband, and many, many more can make a big difference for these communities, but they need some help getting these funds. The Rural Infrastructure Assistance Program aims to do just that, helping places who need the help the most get it. We're grateful to have the support from members of the Rural Caucus, our DCs, our PCs, and many community leaders for this concept who support and understand the importance of this proposal. But I believe we, uh, we need to make sure this is addressed now in the BAA because every week and month we're delayed puts already disadvantaged communities at a further disadvantage. And that's what will happen if we wait until the big bill passes at the end of the session. Deputy Secretary Farnham has uh, been attending these ARPA meetings and he can speak to the mechanics of how the program works and uh, why there's such a need. So I'll now defer to Doug. Thank you, Governor. So as the Governor said, this program is in the BAA because there's a high degree of urgency. We only have until the end of next year to obligate the full $1.05 billion of ARPA state fiscal recovery and at this point, we estimate over 400 million of that 1 billion is already obligated. So all of these programs that were authorized over the last two years, they are in flight, they are moving forward, and we want to make sure that small towns have the fullest opportunity to participate in these programs that they can. Now, a great example of this is we have another round of pre-treatment grants going live in March. As we see at the federal level and the state level, we're gonna have rolling opportunities coming out constantly. And the goal of this program is to help rural communities get uh, prepared as soon as possible so that they can participate. The program, as we call it, is not really a new program, but is a method to get technical assistance out to those communities that need it the most. We're not creating new architecture in Vermont, we're going to leverage existing architecture through the RPCs, through VLCT, through the RDCs, and I apologize for all the acronyms there, but we're going to leverage our existing resources with an RFP that we would publish immediately after the BAA if this is in there. Get this moving as quickly as possible, establish those relationships, and set up retainer agreements with the RPCs to provide focus support to these communities. If they're on the list, then they can work with the communities. We know from our conversations in multiple counties now that the barriers to participation are high for these towns. They need it to be easy. They don't need to fill out a 10-page application and talk to the Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Administration before they get help. They need to be able to go and get help. 
And I think this is an important mechanism to focus that support. So the types of programs that would be eligible, water quality infrastructure, that is a basic need for many communities to move forward. It's kind of a foundational element. Housing development, community recovery, workforce development and business supports, climate change mitigation, other projects that we would evaluate at AOA that are necessary for economic development. Not every project is gonna fit squarely into those boxes, but in the, you know what you see, when you see it, some projects would be very valuable to a community, but not easily put in one of those buckets. We do have the eligibility for that $3 million of technical assistance. Right now is linked to the underserved community index. That's constructed by looking at the needs in a community and balancing them against the capacity. We're in active conversations with legislative partners to modify that and make it as good as it can possibly be to balance the capacity in community against the needs that they're demonstrating to get them the technical assistance. Not all towns of 1,000 people are the same. Not all towns of 2,000 are the same. So it really needs to be a bit more nuanced in who really needs the help the most to take advantage of this opportunity. Again, just focus on the urgency here. This is a short-term program. It's run out of AOA because we have contact with all of the federal programs right now. And we can help bring the partners together and work as a team, as we're so good at in Vermont, to make this program successful. So speaking of our partners, I would like to hand it over to uh, Peter Gregory from the RPCs. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Doug and the governor. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, my name is Peter Gregory. I'm executive director of the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. We serve 30 small towns in uh, primarily Windsor and Orange counties. Uh, very simply, we concur with this initiative and what you've identified as a need in our communities. Uh, many of us have been doing this many, many years and have seen the stresses on our communities, uh, not only in deploying the federal and state resources, um, but also in the staffing that they have and the gaps that they have and the turnover. It's uh, really profound. <clears throat> we are out, the regional planning commissions are out in the field four nights a week in planning commissions and select boards. Uh, energy committees, broadband committees, so we, we see the needs out there and they are real. I think our goal in working with uh, the executive staff is to ensure that, as Doug said, the communities that are selected uh, not only have a demonstrated need, uh, but have a willingness to move forward because there is a time uh, uh, situation that we're facing here and we wanna make sure that we are strategic in our investments in which communities are really ripe for that kind of support. Um, we also support, as regional planning commissions, additional capacity in our own shops to do some of the same work that really we've been doing for, in some cases, 60 years. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here and um, wanna work uh, with you all to kind of flesh out the program in the coming uh, weeks. Thank you. All right, now we'll open it up to questions. Is anybody looking at this through the like, eye of a master planner and saying water, sewer, sharing would be tremendous? We think about this going on, and you know, someplace in Wyndham County could use a bunch of broadband money to get them across the finish line. Yeah, I think every every individual uh, community is different, um, and that's where the where the RPCs come in uh, as well to help them with some of that planning. I'm sure. Uh, they can identify what direction uh, they need to go in, but help with that decision making uh, is something that we'd be, be willing to do as well. I mean, we, we all have to work at this together because, again, as you identified, what one community needs, uh, another one doesn't, and uh, trying to use their attributes to get to where they want to go uh, in the end. Peter, anything you want to add to that? I would just concur, I, you know, the regional planning commissions have built up relationships, you know, for years in the communities and, and know their needs through their town planning and, and uh, development issues. So I think we will be able to ground truth the needs and help target the, the resources where they need to go, the technical capacity. How many projects do you see this money funding? On one hand, $3 million sounds like a lot of money. On the other hand, if I'm a town who's going to do wastewater treatment, uh, that's going to be very expensive. So. What's going to be the impact? Well, again, um, we're talking about some of the smaller communities. So 
Um, there, it's not quite as expansive as you might envision uh, for like a, a Montpelier, Burlington, or Barrie, or, or so forth in terms of uh, sewer uh, stormwater treatment. So these are smaller uh, systems, but it's not just sewer water uh, and uh, stormwater. There are other uh, infrastructure needs uh, that they could utilize as well. So not every community is going to need that infrastructure. Um, but um, we believe uh, in the time frame uh, that we have, the $3 million would go a long ways uh, to getting a jump start on this. Again, because of the time element, uh, the money we have to, it's, it's like we had with other federal dollars. Um, we have a, an end date here unless they extend it, but we won't know that uh, until uh, they, uh, a month or so before. Uh, so we can't take that chance. And, and the rural areas really do need our help. Mary, I'm just trying Anything to make sense of the, you want the context. Are we talking about when this is done, this $3 million will be spent in 15 communities, let's say. I mean, what, what's the impact here overall statewide? So this is um, part of the intention here is to show a targeted investment moving for programs forward. We're not receiving applications right now in some of these areas, but they're expressing needs. So we need to, we need to bridge that gap. I do think out of the 60 communities, um, we would be fortunate if, if half of them come forward and work with us. I think if I'm pleasantly surprised and more come forward and, and really want to work with us, that would be great. Uh, we are having a lot of turnout at our, at our county-based events. So we know that some of the municipalities definitely want to work with us. I think th for the impact of the funds, state dollars, part of this is to do a needs assessment and to identify federal funding opportunities where we're able to line things up. We're going to be helping those towns find four or five times more money than we spend locally on those projects. So anytime we have match dollars, we're looking at potentially getting you know four times more out of our investment. So this is to try to help us get more federal money not only from the ARPA state fiscal recovery to balance the scales there, but the inflation, the Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act, also known as Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, that has some programs that impact municipalities, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Omnibus Package. If we can get them prepared to engage in those programs, we could see a lot more uh, project activity in these rural areas just by helping them set the foundation. So that's part of the goal here. I think uh, Doug makes a good point in terms of uh, other federal programs that they may be viable for that community as well. It might not be ARPA in, in this case. It might be something else uh, that would be, it'd be more advantageous for them or a combination of the two. Um, but that, that's another reason why we need to get a jump start on this. So if we're overwhelmed, let's say, and the $3 million doesn't cover everyone, uh, we have an opportunity in the next three to four months uh, to put additional funds in the, uh, the big bill um, to satisfy those needs. So this gives us an opportunity to see what's out there because we don't know for sure. I mean, we targeted $3 million for planning, but, but it could exceed that. We just, we just don't know uh, what the demand will be. Governor, speaking of the unwinding of some of these federal funds in the spring, I believe, uh, DIVA is going to be uh, starting to unwind some of the Medicaid funds, uh, I think some 30,000 Vermonters that have been covered through the pandemic will no longer be covered. Um, what do you see the impact of, of that, you know, having for Vermonters and their health care coverage? Yeah, well, this is a very real issue, and that's what happens uh, during these emergency times for the last two to three years. Um, there has been a lot of money that we've been able to take advantage of here, and, uh, and it's helped a lot of people. But this money is coming to an end, and we have to off-ramp uh, this, and, and it will have an, a real impact on some people. But we're trying to do whatever we can uh, to create this uh, this slope uh, that is more manageable. Uh, I might ask uh, Secretary Samuelson if she could comment on, on this in particular. is that for many of these Vermonters, their situations may have changed during the pandemic, um, but we simply haven't gone back and redetermined eligibility, which is our normal process. Um, and so what this will do 
was go back and see have they gotten job has has their life changed and they no longer um, need Medicaid insurance um, defaulting back to our pre-pandemic Medicaid position so for many Vermonters um, they may have other alternative coverage um, that's gone into effect during this time period and this is an opportunity to, to check in on that so again pre the, um, many of these changes came into effect during the public health emergency to serve a very specific time and need um, and we are um, at the end of that point and it's time for us to begin to unwind governor when we were talking about medicaid or everyone eats or some of the emergency housing funds you know you, you talk about that that winding down how, how do we make sure that just broadly we don't hit a cliff right i mean the the legislature you know there's of course many of calling for any of these programs on the legislature to extend funding so i guess how well again how when, when when is a good time to do that uh, and i would say uh, during these times when we have a the economy is, is booming. Um, there are plenty of jobs available. There's all kinds of funding. There's surplus money in our own budgets. This is probably a good time as any uh, to ramp down, if there is a good time. Um, because obviously, if the federal government were to uh, continue with some of the dollars flowing into Vermont, that'd be advantageous to Vermont. But that's not being realistic. Unless, of course, um, we have a great congressional delegation. Maybe they can make something happen but the decision has been made in Washington to end these programs. And uh, it's a, an enormous amount of money that we can't fulfill on our own without sacrificing other investments. Um, keeping in line with that, a lot of school nutrition folks are gonna be coming to the building tomorrow to urge lawmakers to permanently fund universal school meals. Is there funding? for another year of free breakfast and lunch for all kids in your budget? We, um, no, I mean, we went through, this was uh, this was money that was put in the education fund, I believe, um, if I'm not, if I have that right, um, but it was for a one year uh, universal program and uh, we didn't include that. Uh, obviously, uh, we wanna help those in need, uh, those who can't uh, afford uh, their breakfast and lunch, uh, we would provide for that. My own feeling is, uh, and I had this concern uh, when we had this debate last year, was a universal program uh, would, uh, would in fact uh, burden those we're trying to help, uh, to help those who are affluent enough to pay for it. So I, I, I would prefer that we take care of those who can't afford it on their own and help them out. But those who can't afford it should be able to provide for their families. Um, Secretary French, do you have anything to add to this? Yes, Governor, I'm just going to confirm that you're correct. That, um, this year, one year was funded out of an education fund surplus. Um, so it is something uh, it was part for a one year initiative. Um, we are working on a household income form process, which is uh, sort of a connection between this policy and the revised pupil weights. Um, but I also was going to mention that there are some adjustments happening at the federal level to the reimbursement rates around meals. So some of the costs uh, related to uh, providing the universal meals will, will need to be readjusted based on those new uh, supports from the federal government. And we're working on that now. Uh, Governor, uh, and several of us in this room have been asked to leave committee rooms, because there's not enough room in the, in the committee rooms. Uh, some pretty nice digs you have here. Uh, any, any chance of, of this, this room being used for uh, repurpose for some legislative meetings? No. <laughs> Why not? This is, the, this is my state house office. This is the governor's office, and will remain so. We, we're a, we're a, a part of this uh, as well, this institution and uh, we need a place to land. So we're part of the process. Governor, There's plenty of space, by the way. There's 133 <laughs> state has all kinds of room. Uh, 109 has all kinds of room. It's been identified. It's, it's actually been saved and been empty uh, for the last couple of years. So there's plenty of space available if they want to stretch out just a little bit. But it's been reserved, um, and they're paying for it. 
What do you say to some of the retired state employees who feel like you are forcing them into this Medicare Advantage program, which by many critics say saves money by dying benefits to members? Yeah, yeah I, I don't see it that way, and uh, maybe we'll be proven wrong, but um, what's been described to me, and, and a, a lot of this, we'll have further conversations about this in the not too distant future, but from my standpoint, this program would save the state money, but it also save um, the retirees money as well and give them added benefits. This isn't the same as we're seeing nonstop on CNN. Uh, this isn't that program. This is customized for us. Uh, the NEA uh, has this. Um, the state, uh, state college retirees have this. And I haven't heard any complaints from them. So I think there is some conflict in between what we're hearing on a national level for some of these programs and what we're actually proposing. So I think we'll be able to, we need to communicate that uh, in a better way and, and prove uh, that this is viable and viable for them, better benefits and viable for the state. So it seems like a win for everyone um, from my standpoint. Is this something that you feel you can put into place on your own, or is this a negotiated benefit, or, or does this require legislation? Well, I guess it depends on who you talk to, right? Um, from my standpoint, I think we can do it. Um, but we didn't include this in our budget. We didn't include the, the savings. Uh, we want to uh, support the process, and, and we, we feel good about this proposal, and we're hoping to convince the retirees uh, that uh, this is good for them as well. So you think when you're able to communicate the benefits of this program that the retirees will see the benefits involved? I believe so. I mean, I think we just need to prove it and show them uh, that they will save money, we will save money, and they will have additional benefits as a result. And I think, again, I think it's going to be a better one than what they have today. And if the Retirees Association doesn't come around to your way of doing this, then will you drop it? Well, we'll see. I mean, again, we'll, we'll continue to do our part to, to make sure they understand the facts. Um, the House is going to begin taking testimony on shield laws for abortion providers later this week. Um, do you have any concerns as it relates to that legislation? Um, I don't know enough about it to maybe comment other than to say we want to protect anyone uh, who is providing uh, a service here in Vermont, uh, but uh, but I don't know what that piece of legislation will entail. So look forward to, to hearing more about it. On board entirely conceptually though. Yeah, I mean, I have no real problem with it. Um, so, but I, you know, I guess facts matter. So I need to know the specifics. Governor, there's also a new gun bill that's been proposed in the Senate Judiciary X4, I believe, banning um, the uh, straw sales or straw purchases. Is this part of the bigger bill, S4? Yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. New I wouldn't call that the gun bill. I would call that something else. But gun. I think there are some. I think there are some provisions in there. What do you make of it? What, what do you see? Well, again, I, I, I think I've made this fairly clear uh, that. Uh, I think we've done a lot over the last few years. Uh, I think we need to make the system better, and the NICS system in particular. I think we're going to need some congressional help on that. Uh, we need to educate people uh, more about the red flag laws that exist and how they're utilized better and how that interacts with the NICS system. So I think we have a ways to go, but, um, but I'm, I'm not feeling as though we need to do anything with our gun laws at this point in time. Has your administration formally put the letter uh, requested that the legislature delay implementing raise the age yet last week or there might be a three-year delay the commissioner works might know about this yeah yeah um yeah i don't know if jay is on or commissioner morrison have we sent the letter correct specifically asking about this the document Yes, the recommendation uh, that we intend to make is that um, 
the current print pause continue for another couple of years? And I'm, I'm sorry that I can't find the exact section that I'm looking for. Um, currently, it's, it's set to expire on 7-1 of 23. Um, and that our recommendation would be that we lower the age of automatic family court jurisdiction for delinquents um, and repeal the timeline or defer increasing the age up to 20 years old. So it's, as I said, it's currently set to expire on July 1st, and we are going to make a recommendation that that be deferred or repealed. Can, can you maybe extrapolate as to, to why we're pushing it, proposing to push it back? I don't think I am prepared to, to talk about that right now. Um, it's part of a broader set of policy recommendations that we are going to be uh, recommending to uh, fill some gaps that we've identified in the last couple of years since the legislation uh, took effect. Uh, so I, I think I'm going to leave it there for now, and we will be uh, sharing more about our position on that in the coming weeks as S4 and other bills make their way through the system. So late last week, your house bills introduced uh, 66 and a new family medical leave insurance program. Um, and coming with that, it would create a payroll tax and upstream benefits to 12 weeks of paid leave along with 100% reimbursement. I guess if I could just get your thoughts on that, do you think there is a middle ground that you and Democrats can work with? Because this plan isn't necessarily surprising that they came out with it, but do you guys think you'll be able to find some type of middle ground throughout this session? I think our middle ground is uh, going with our proposal um, for a volunteer program uh, that we can test drive, so to speak, and then we can we can identify the impacts and how do we broaden it from there. But, uh, but at this point, uh, I'm not in favor of uh, any payroll tax uh, at all and uh, raising any taxes at this point in time when we're seeing record surpluses and all this growth and money uh, in the system. So uh, building the foundation, I think, could be utilized uh, uh, with this new uh, proposal that we put on the table that we're, we're actually doing with the state employees and seeing how we broaden that. And then also just us on two, they would also want to reappropriate $20 million from the general fund to a medical leave insurance special fund. I guess is that something you would think is necessary or no? Well, again, I think going the route that we have envisioned uh, with a volunteer program could lead to something like that in the future, but, uh, but I don't think we're ready for that. What are your thoughts on uh, Doug Hopper's recent report on the TIF district in Burlington being just rife with errors and uh, shortchanging the education fund by hundreds of thousands of dollars? Did, you, did that give you pause about that tool as a redevelopment uh, tool uh, around the state? Which well, for, first, first of all, the, the state auditor hasn't exactly been a fan of TIFs uh, over the last few years. I have been. Um, so I would say that he's, he's brought up some good points. Uh, but Burlington, uh, the TIF district in Burlington, was amongst one of the original uh, TIF districts. And uh, we've cleaned up a lot of those things, uh, fixed a lot of things uh, in, in over, uh, overseeing and requirements and so forth. So I, I believe um, that the, the TIF um, program that we have today is much different than then. Um, but in terms of, I, I think, I think it's for Burlington to work out. Um, I, we haven't seen that type of problem with any of the other districts. Has, but there been, has, has anyone looked at I mean, I I'm, sure, I'm sure the auditor has looked, yes. Yeah, I would think that that degree of either lack of ability or errors that he's characterized would, would, would make you would give you pause for other districts in the state that used us. Well, again, uh, things have changed a bit since that one. I, I think we, I feel good about our program. Um, in terms of the shortchanging the ed fund, I think that's been the argument about TIF districts all along. Um, my, from my standpoint, um, I don't believe these uh, these projects would have been started without without the TIF districts. So we wouldn't have had the money going into the education fund to begin with. So um, it's just a different philosophy. And uh, but I'll let uh, Burlington uh, will work through some of that. And we'll do the same uh, on our level uh, to make sure that it's secure. Okay. On a totally different subject, that's okay. Right outside this building, there's a very large portable diesel generator. It's parked next to the state house and hooked up to the state house because the battery pack that was installed a couple of years ago in the basement was very quickly found to be uh, characterized, let's say, as a biohazard. 
to the building by the insurance company uh, that the state has for its buildings. And uh, those batteries had to be removed from the state house. You praised that project uh, a couple of years ago pretty, um, pretty strongly as uh, out of the box thinking and positive thing. Um, what's your take on that? Well, I still do uh, praise the concept. <clears throat> Uh, I think having uh, energy storage uh, with batteries is the future. I mean, we see it uh, on individual homes with the Tesla. Um, they came out with the first battery pack, and there's been many more since. I think it's part of the answer uh, overall. Um, microgrids uh, with large scale capacity to, to store this energy is going to be part of the future. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, again, uh, that I don't know if, obviously, any of us uh, contemplated that it would be a fire hazard in the, in the state house, in the basement, um, but, but that's what the insurance company said, uh, so we had no choice but to remove it. So, uh, lesson learned uh, there. Uh, check with your insurance company before you do any, any big alterations of any sort. So, um, again, we'll... Uh, We'll t we took that one on the chin, and uh, we'll do better next time, but, it, but it's something that we learn, and we're going to have to continue to learn uh, as we evolve into this new future that is really going to, to have to utilize um, some of these large-scale energy storage devices in order to level out uh, the peaks and valleys of our energy needs. Um, Commissioner Tierney, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Governor, I think you fit that very nicely. I think the point here is that no transition is going to go completely smoothly, and we have to embrace this kind of event, not because it's desirable, not because it's how we want to proceed, but because, as you said, it, it teaches us what we need to know. From this point forward, that will be a tick mark for everybody who engages in this kind of work. But the idea behind it, is very much valid and it's what we would do again and would try to do again once we can figure out how to develop, uh, encounter this particular obstacle. The path has to go forward. Would you like to see along that there's uh, legalized sports studying this session? Yes. Why? Because I think we've, uh, we've studied it for quite some time. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, the sports gambling happening in Vermont. Uh, much like the use of cannabis, it's something that has been utilized for quite some time. We just need to do it in a safe manner. Um, so the sports betting, I think, falls into that same category. you have concerns about problem gambling? And I have concerns about uh, cannabis uh, as well and uh, some of the safety concerns I see on our highway and with our kids and, and some of the products that might be, um, might be available to our youth. Um, I have concerns there. Um, there are always concerns with anything uh, as we move forward, but the reality is most of the states around us are doing something, and, uh, and it's, being, it's being done here in the state, uh, and we just need to find a path forward so that we can provide for the protections necessary uh, to make it viable for us and uh, for Vermonters and our guests who come to visit us. Governor, you say it's being done here now in the state. Are you referring to illegal yeah. activities? Sure. Okay. We'll go to the, uh, we have a few folks on the phones. We'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, you know, with the RAND report, they were, they were assuming the, the current structure of child care and not looking at trying to do that. That wasn't their mandate. Did, do you have a... Um, have you considered uh, bringing the zero to five kids into the regular public school system? And if so, how much added cost would that be if you looked into that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about um, child care over the last six years. Um, and we put a lot of money in, into that area and we continue to do so um, because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, having a cradle to career approach uh, is something that I've also talked a lot about. So eventually I think it will be part of our normal education system. Um, but it's not ready, I don't believe, for prime time at this point um, because of space needs and so forth. And um, 
we can put a lot of money into the system, but some of the same challenges are going to be there that we're experiencing in every other sector across the state, whether it's we don't have enough teachers, we don't have enough snowplow drivers, we don't have enough uh, uh, state police officers, uh, we don't have enough healthcare workers, and we won't have enough early uh, childhood educators either. Um, so we need to build our system, we need more housing, we need more sewer water and storm water, we need the basic fundamentals in order to attract more people into the state. So again, um, I think the, the proposal we put forward, uh, I think takes, takes care of some of that and gives us an opportunity to start building this, this structure out. But it, I think uh, the money that we put forward uh, goes a long ways towards doing that. So what, is, what is your general reaction to um, you know the, the cost of the RAND report and, and what basically what the, the RAND report stated? Well, was, you know, the range was anywhere from a hundred and something million dollars to six hundred and something million dollars. So I was shocked at the range uh, first of all, uh, but then when you get into the details uh, and start to uh, Uncover uh, what what is proposed and what they're trying to uh, what they were trying to get to. Um, we know it's a lot of money, um, but uh, but at the same time, I'm a believer in early uh, care and learning, and uh, and I think I look forward uh, to working with folks over the next uh, couple of years in order to do that. Um, but but again, you got to walk before you run, and and I believe that the proposal we're putting forward. Uh, makes the most sense at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Stuart Ledbetter. I'll just be listening. Anyone else in the room? Um, one of the concerns initially from Democratic lawmakers about your child care proposal is that it didn't at least on its face include uh, money to increase wages for child care workers. Um, your thoughts about the need to increase those wages given the, I think the median wage is somewhere around, I don't know, a little bit 14? Well, in putting more money into the system, $56 million, I think will cover uh, some of the wage increases we'll see as well. I mean, I think it's it's something that we're seeing uh, through this, um, the inflation that we're seeing throughout the, the state and country. Wages are increasing and they need to increase more, but um, to artificially increase wages isn't necessarily going to get us to where we need to go because we don't have the people. Um, I thought the entirety of the $56 million went towards CCFAT. It does, but, uh, but it goes in the pockets of somebody, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's money that's injected there, uh, utilized, paid into the system, um, so that the money has to go to the program. So eventually, I think uh, the, the um, educators will benefit as a result. messages to what this could mean for Vermonters if this continues? In you know, we've been through this uh, a number of times over the years. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. Um, I think if we were worried, that worried about our debt, we shouldn't have spent so much money uh, and not have this, uh, this fight uh, to raise the debt ceiling because I think it's an, we've, already, we've already done the damage, right? And we've already spent the money. So um, this should be, we should, come together some way, somehow, and um, take this off the table, because we're looking at the wrong thing. I mean, would you agree that, that this is money that's already been spent, right? So it, uh, is it, are Republicans in Washington sort of raising a false issue here? I don't know if it's a false issue, because debt is debt, and I don't like debt any more than anyone else, but I should have thought of that when you were spending the money. Should have brought that up then, right? I mean, maybe there's some provision to keep you, maybe there should be um, some sort of proposal that shows you what the debt would be if you spend this X, X amount of money um, to give some folks pause as to what they're doing. But I don't know if they even put that together, right? They spend the money 
and nobody looks at how much you're really borrowing to do that, I don't believe. I mean, if I understand this correctly, this is money that's already been spent. Yeah. So doesn't the government have a, an obligation to pay for it? Yes. That, no, I'm, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying in future years, when you're, when you're debating budgets, that's like we do, if, uh, if you should know how you're going to pay for it. And that's part of my concern with the budget that we put into place this year. Uh, as you'll notice, uh, I'm, not, I'm not taking a lot of the money and putting it into base because I'm not, I don't think we should, we should um, use what I, what I would uh, describe as one-time money for ongoing programs. So we have a debt affordability committee for the, for the capital bill. We've downgraded how much we borrow every year. Um, this is down to about 54, 56 million, something like that this year, um, which is down from previous years. Uh, it was up to a high of $100 million, I think, back in the 90s, maybe 2000, somewhere in there, um, where we were borrowing $100 million a year. Um, so since this debt affordability uh, committee takes a look, determine how much we should be borrowing, uh, how much of a debt service can we afford. Um, so um, we found a way to do that. I think I know the numbers are gigantic on the, on the federal end, but I think that they should do the same. You know, I mean, let's talk about how much debt we want to take on before you spend the money as you're developing your spending bill. It sounds like you're saying that the House Republicans are putting up their fight sort of at the wrong yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that this should, they should come to agreement that we, we need to raise the debt, debt ceiling. They should come to that agreement now. But they should also put into place in Congress some way uh, to, uh, to make sure that we're, we're not overspending and we're not overborrowing because it's a real issue. Uh, House General is now talking about homelessness. Any thought about your administration requiring people receiving emergency housing services to, to work on the issues that landed them in homelessness? Well, we're, we have services. That's what we've been trying to do, um, is to, to try and identify what put people into homelessness to begin with and try to help them uh, provide those wraparound services uh, to, to bring them out of homelessness, to give them a permanent home. So I'd say we, we're doing that. We stepped up our efforts. Uh, uh, we're doing that right now, uh, and we'll continue to do that because I think that's the right path. Is there a requirement, though, that people receiving services work on their stuff? I understand that there are services offered. Yeah, I, I don't know that we have any requirement, specific requirement, uh, but I might ask Secretary Samuelson if she's aware. Governor, thank you. You are correct. There's no specific requirement that makes individuals get employment or um, address other issues related to um, their homelessness. What I can say is that the state has significantly over the last couple of months um, in partnership with community providers um, stepped up efforts to gather information around what the barriers are that individuals are facing in their homelessness to um, also um, have teams of individuals who are case managers nurse case managers um, work uh, teams that also include individuals to help with employment and navigating economic services as well as housing have really come together uh, to uh, work with families and individuals experiencing homelessness um, to dig into the barriers and to help them navigate um, how to address those barriers. So an unprecedented um, effort to really both understand and to provide supports and services um, for those individuals experiencing homelessness to help them make that transition. Um, the House Judiciary Committee is starting two days of testimony on a shield wall to protect patients and providers from out-of-state litigation. Yeah, we did. You did have that we question did. before. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> 
Jason, you do me better. <laughs> That's the same thing to me. <laughs> um, but we're taking a look at it. I don't know the specifics of the, uh, that uh, legislation, um, but, um, but if there's a need, we will work with them to provide and support in any way we can. But support you? Well, it, dep it depends. I don't know the specifics yeah. of the legislation, so I, I don't want to go out and them and say I support it mm -hmm. until I know. But, um, but we'll be at the table as well. But the spirit of it, perhaps? Perhaps the spirit of it, okay. yes. Okay, thanks. I've heard some lawmakers express skepticism about the wisdom of the state spending millions of dollars to incentivize businesses to move to the state in an environment where the acute labor shortage you outlined for all those different categories you listed yeah. who, who were short of. Why would we continue to spend millions of dollars to bring new businesses to the state where we're already having difficulty staffing the businesses who are already here and invested in right. the state? Well, I, I understand um, some of the difficulty in, in envisioning that, but uh, but we can't stand still, right? We have to plan for the next uh, business uh, that will be supporting Vermont. If we if we did that in every instance, we thought I thought Keurig was going to be here uh, forever. Um, they left. Um, IBM I thought was going to be here, a staple in Vermont was going to be here forever. They're no longer here. Um, so we have to be one step ahead all the time. So at the same time, we're trying to address all the, the needs uh, that we have uh, to bring more people into the state. We have to continue uh, to try and build out uh, the, the uh, businesses as well and to spread them out a bit more, not so concentrated in one area of the state. Uh, and that would be more beneficial uh, to in some of the areas that we're talking about today, um, where they have, like uh, Derby, Newport area has a 5% unemployment rate right now, where the rest of the state has about 2.6. So that's where we need more businesses uh, in the areas of the state that have have workers uh, and could, could utilize them and to stabilize Vermont in a much different way. So we are actively pursuing more businesses, but we're trying to disperse them as geographically um, diverse as possible uh, to help those regions that are, have been left behind. And in your budget address, you seem to suggest that maybe some of that money might be spent on building or rehabbing buildings in the state yeah, that's, in an effort to lure businesses, yeah. or would it be done in concert with a business that already wants to come? Not to lure them, but to just be prepared. Like, you can build, you can have a, mm -hmm. a building like they've done in St. Albans successfully. Um, they, uh, they'll put up a building with a, a fairly large footprint um, that could accommodate almost any business. Uh, so then you can go from there. If you have a shell and you have a foundation, it's all permitted, ready to go. Uh, then you can build out the interior, make those alterations uh, in order to satisfy whatever business you're trying to attract. So it's more um, kind of a cookie cutter uh, type approach so that we're prepared when and if uh, there's a business that wants to come because we've lost out on some businesses that uh, that have moved on and gone to other areas because we haven't been able to accommodate their needs. They, we just don't have uh, the infrastructure they need. Don't, don't most businesses who want to relocate to a state like have very specific needs for their type of business and they can't just go into a cookie cutter shell? Oh, I, I would, I would not agree with that. Uh, I think that the Bobby Miller uh, did this successfully. Uh, he was speculating on on buildings uh, in, throughout throughout Chinning County, uh, and for just that reason, uh, and he would he would build something that would accommodate a number of different businesses from all sectors. So it really is about the shell foundation, and then you can go from there. Or, you know, you wouldn't have to put the floor in. You could just have the outside uh, foundation and the shell, and uh, the rest would go pretty quick. Does that get the state into a development business that sort of feels a little bit outside of its normal well, sort of uh, comfort zone? Again, we do that with the RDCs right now. They, they do that. Um, they did it in St. Albans. They do it in other areas as well. Um, and successfully. Georgia, they did it in Georgia. They have an industrial park uh, that 
that some, then somebody buys that, uh, might lease it for a while, uh, and then moves on. Uh, so it makes sense uh, in, uh, from a timing perspective. All right. All right. Thank you very much.